Nigeria, officially recognized as the Federal Republic of Nigeria, home to a number of ancient and indigenous kingdoms and states that has existed for millennia, the modern state of which was born when Lord Frederick Lugard amalgamated the Southern and the Northern Protectorate in 1914, attained independence from the British in 1960. Over 200 million people and over 250 ethnic groups the most populous black nation in Africa, the most populous black nation in the world, and the sixth most populous nation on planet Earth. Home to many indigenous religions, including Christianity and Islam. But before the advent of these two major religions, most Nigerians practice various traditional African religions. Then enters Christianity and Islam. Split in almost two equal halves between Christianity, which is predominantly in the South, and Islam, which is predominantly in the north. For many years, the people of Nigeria have seized any opportunity to show the rest of the world their zeal and desire to be reckoned among those people. And because of this, today there are more churches per square mile in Nigeria than there are anywhere else in the world. Some of the largest church buildings and wealthiest pastors are from here. There are more pastors and churches here than there are in all the remaining 53 countries in Africa put together. And this has led to a rise in the Pentecostal brand of evangelical preachers who see themselves as God's CEOs on earth, presiding over large conglomerates of spiritual corporations and business empires. Why some experts insist that the proliferation of churches has led to a heretic representation of Jesus Christ himself and, his, and the corruption of his teaching, others, mostly hardline analysts, insist that what is happening in Nigeria today is a mockery of the hallowed and the sacred Christian faith. As the multiplication of churches and religious places of worship positively influence the way Nigerians treat one another, does it in any way sway the way they conduct their everyday businesses? Have Nigerians imbibed the teaching attributed to Jesus Christ, the founder of the Christian faith, as recorded in the Holy Bible, in such a way that we build a morally upright nation? This is God's secret. According to Wikipedia, Christianity began in the first century AD after the death of Jesus Christ as a sect of the Jewish people in Judea and then quickly spread throughout the Roman Empire. Despite early persecutions of Christians, the religion later became sanctioned by the Roman emperors and thus became a state religion throughout the In the Middle Ages, the religion spread into northern Europe and Russia and during the age of exploration, it extended throughout the world and today the largest, most populous, and the greatest religion the world and mankind have ever seen. Again, according to Wikipedia, Christianity came into Nigeria in the 15th century AD through Augustinian and Capuchin monks from Portugal. A few years ago, according to the Pew Research Center, with an estimated 49.3% of the population being Christian, it meant that Nigeria had over 80 million Christian faithfuls living within our shores at the time. And today, Christianity boasts of the largest population of adults in Nigeria than any other African country. Some analysts have traced the origin of Pentecostalism in Nigeria to the works of men like the late great Pentecostal sage Archbishop Benson Idawasa of blessed memory. They say in the 1970s, his works led to a wave of Pentecostal expansion in the country a thing that was already being spearheaded in the United States of America at the time, thereby giving birth to new churches and pastors, many of which attracted until this day are still attracting large followers through a message that promises all kinds of miracles and solutions to the problems of the faithful. With an estimated over 1 billion followers worldwide, this brand of Pentecostal Christianity has made the prosperity gospel a global phenomenon 
popularized and commercialized by great Pentecostal preachers cut across different cultures. Today, the prosperity gospel is one of Nigeria's largest exports, with mega churches boasting of over 15 million members and the footing in practically every continent. And these churches, led by private individuals, make billions annually. And unlike Rwanda, there are no legal or financial regulations governing the operation of these churches in Nigeria today. Because of this lack of regulation, we have seen all kinds of people come forward to declare that they have been called by God to preach the gospel, and thereafter went on to preach their own version of what they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is. <laughs> One of such teachings, the prosperity gospel as I mentioned earlier, emphasizing God's will for the prosperity of the believers to be attained only through faith, devotion, tithe and offering, and positive confessions. For example, visit an average Nigerian Pentecostal church service today and you will easily see thousands of worshippers congregate for either a Sunday service or one of their usual vigils. You would often hear the preacher declare, today's theme is unlocking God's divine destiny. The congregation would usually sing choruses and dance. The pastor, usually well dressed in flamboyant and attires, would mount the stage, read from the Holy Bible, and ushers would be seen thereafter distributing envelopes among the congregation. And the congregants, alongside the satellite viewers, would also be reminded that they can also pay their tithe and offering via POS terminals or bank transfers with the pastor's bank account details displaying on large screen within the church auditorium. The pastor will then proceed to explain to the congregation that giving to God is the first step towards unlocking your divine destiny and opening the doors to prosperity. Across most Pentecostal churches in Nigeria today, the message is simple and the same. Once you give to God, God will attend to all your needs. This, in the clearest of terms, is the prosperity gospel. As a result of this message, according to a recent Forbes report, some of the richest pastors in the world are from Nigeria, with a combined net worth of around $235 million at a time. Bearing in mind the high level of poverty in Nigeria, the considerable wealth of prosperity preachers, many of whose members are extremely poor by the way, has been a long-standing topic of debate and controversy here. And for those who consider this prosperity gospel exploitative, there exists a frustration at a seemingly ever-growing popularity among everyday Nigerians who would do anything to defend the pastors. Consider this, the richest churches in the world in order of wealth are the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Church of England, the Church of Scientology and the Jehovah's Witnesses, all of them with a net worth running into billions of dollars. Is it not ironic that none of these churches have their leaders among the richest pastors in the world, not even the Pope, who is equivalent to the president of any average country today? However, no Nigerian mega Pentecostal church has ever made it into any of the richest and the wealthiest church in the world list. Yet most of their founders, like Bishop Oyedebo, Pastor Chris Oyakidon, Pastor Adeboye and Prophet T.B. Joshua, just to mention a few, are among some of the richest pastors in the world. And Nigeria, the country from which they operate, ranks as one of the 147th most corrupt country of the world. It is home to the second deadliest terrorist group. It is the most unsafe place to be given birth to, and only recently it displaced India as the, most, as the poverty capital of the world, with an almost entirely eroded moral values. The question that Nigerians, both clergy and the laity, should be asking themselves today is, what was the example of Jesus who the Nigerian pastors represent today and follow? When he lived in the, world, in the material world and interacted with the things and the people who feel it. Experts say there is a sense in which the Christian theology of Christ's incarnation was an impoverishing act in itself. They say the very fact that Jesus took on human flesh and dwelt among sinful humans in the filth of this world had to set aside the wealth of heaven. 
is in itself a type of poverty. And the Apostle Paul himself seemed to portray this fact when he wrote at Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 that Jesus emptied himself of his privileges by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Another example is Jesus' nativity story which includes him being born in a foreign city, presumably without family members and friends around, being placed in a manger, literally a feeding trough, and being visited by shepherds, those who were considered as the outcast and the dredge of society. In describing Jesus' circumcision, St. Luke reports that Mary and Joseph offered two pigeons as a temple sacrifice for Mary's purification as ordered in the Bible book of Leviticus because according to the Bible book of Luke chapter number 2 verse 22 she could not and I quote afford a lamb then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons for her purification apparently then Jesus's parents were too poor to offer the required lamb that was prescribed in the book of Leviticus even though Jesus was born into a family that was Part of the lower economic class. 30 years after, during his earthly ministry, his material life was not any better. Even he himself commented on his economic status when he said, Foxes have bows and birds of the air have nets, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And the Gospel narratives too bear out this testimony when he reported that he preached from a borrowed boat, he rode on a borrowed cart, he multiplied borrowed food and even was buried on a borrowed tomb. In fact, most of Jesus' material needs, as well as those of his disciples, were apparently met by donations from a group of devout women who accompanied him. In his Gospel, St. Luke refers to, and I quote, Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who is Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for Jesus and his disciples out of their means. But what do we see today among those who profess to be Jesus' ambassadors or God's CEOs on it? Have we not reached a point in our history as a people, a juncture of our political and socio-economic life, where while searching for lasting solutions to our national challenges, we take a very serious look at the contributory factors induced by religion to these challenges? If, as some pastors insist, Prosperity, wealth, and good health are the sole sign of God's approval, favor, and blessing. What should a believer do if he loses one or all of them? By aligning material prosperity and physical well-being to God's approval, are we not fostering ideologies and norms that are deeply in sync with traditional neoliberal philosophy? If prosperity and well-being are a function of a good relationship with God, who is to blame for unemployment or poverty or all the other social vices and ills that plagues our society? Surely it is not the government. And are we not making it easier for citizens to accept or excuse the government's failings? And is this ideology, made prominent by many Pentecostal preachers, prosperity preachers today, not encouraging adherents to believe that they can escape the dysfunction of society? Because, quote and unquote, no earthly institution can hold back the plan of God. We must learn to hold our leaders to account for the ills in society rather than blame innocent people or lay it all at the feet of the divine. Scandinavian countries like Sweden and Norway, for example, are often praised for having some of the highest performing governments in the world. But it might interest you to know that these countries also have some of the lowest number of people who identify as religion. Why is this so? We must understand that the only winners of this prosperity at all cost ideology are the prosperity preachers themselves who lead churches that earn millions of untaxed nairas. And, and the unfortunate reality is that for the majority of believers, the promise of the prosperity gospel is yet to be realized. The government may be another winner as it has managed to evade accountability through the vehicle of the I cannot be poor or seek prosperity gospel. Our God's CEOs on earth must begin to add a rethink because Jesus clearly stated in the Holy Bible that what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? 
I believe one of the duties of our Christian leaders is for them to function as a function of the Nigerian nation, breaking out any time she goes around. We have seen this happen many times in the history and in many parts of the world. Why does it appear that the situation is always different in Nigeria? In the Holy Bible, the synoptic gospel explains why John the Baptist, Jesus' relative and forerunner, was murdered. Herod, who was sub king of Galilee under the Roman Empire at the time, had had him in prison because he recruited Herod for divorcing his wife and unlawfully taking Herodias, the wife of Herod's brother, as wife. For this reason, the preacher's name entered the king's bad news, and the rest, as they say, is history. We know that more than anything that came before or after it, the fall of the Berlin Wall was a prominent symbol of the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and the end of the Cold War. It was, it, it was after this that the captive nations of the falling Soviet Empire became free and the Soviet Union itself was peacefully dissolved. The point here is that the late great saint Pope John Paul II, a Christian leader himself, played a very prominent role in saying to all that. Even Jesus Christ was constantly at war with the religious authorities of his day because he never ceased to speak out against their hypocrisy and corruption. Speaking for truth, for justice and the voiceless has always been the tradition with real followers of Jesus from every corner of the globe throughout history. Why should the situation be different among Pentecostals, especially in Nigeria? Jesus explicitly warned that man cannot serve God and mammon, which is the God of money. He warned that it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of the needle than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. He is on record as chasing the money changers from the temple. He was even quoted as saying, quote and unquote, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. The term lay up as used in the verse in the Bible refers to not allowing one's possession to possess one. Jesus was in that verse clearly warning against excessive materialism and greed. St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, also warned against excessive greed, even as opposed to Paul himself also admonished that the love of money is the root of all evil, as the light and salt of this nation. The church is supposed to get involved in the problems facing this nation and speak out against inequality in the system. It is our duty to care for the poor and give guidance to the lost. How can a materialistic church in a country where citizens live below two dollars in a day function in that regard? Yet we see bishops who own private jets and universities, who are engaged in money laundering and many other shady businesses in foreign land whose family members control their churches, who sees on multi-billion dollar business empires as God's CEOs on earth, yet do not pay tax, who romance and frolic with political leaders, and who do not have a clear program of helping the poor, both in their churches and in society. It is on record that the Nigerian church earns over five trillion dollar naira annually from tithes, offering and other related church businesses. Yet, Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria, PFN, and Christian Association of Nigeria can took many years for them to build just a simple ecumenical center in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. Today, countless Christians in the north are experiencing untold poverty, and added to that, they are facing unprecedented persecution and atrocities at the hands of terrorists. And yet, it is NGOs, mainly NGOs from foreign countries, that raise money for victims of these atrocities, who are mainly Christians, by the way. Rather than a church that protects the sheep, evangelizes the lost, and speaks truth to power, we have a clergy so lost in materialism that one of them even called for the arrest of every daddy geo, including himself, at some point in our history. In as much as this is not a call for pastors to become poor or not to be wealthy, or a call asking them to take up the role of government, the question is, of what importance is the wealth of the church if Nigerians are hungrier today, if Nigerians are the second most terrorized country in the world, affecting mostly Christians in the north, and if over 600,000 Nigerian youths flee our shores every day through the Mediterranean in search of greener pastures in foreign countries, as the light and the salt of the earth, what leadership is the church and the clergy 
offering the people of this country? Maybe time will provide the answers, or maybe not. Once again, I remain Albert Afeso Akonbi for Dopla Films Documentary Series. If you like this video and you enjoy the content, please give us a thumbs up. Follow our various social media handles showing on your screen right now. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and please, please and please do support us with a little donation to enable us continue to make content like this. And please do remember to tell someone to tell someone about two platforms. Thank you for your usual support. Till we meet again, stay blessed.